I'm Jim Autry, and it is my honor to welcome you to this 24th Americans with Disabilities Act anniversary roundtable. My job here is to introduce someone. It seems completely irrelevant having seen this welcome, but I'm going to do it anyway. Um, I begin, of all things, with a poem written 25 years ago. The name of it is Leo, and it's about a former neighbor of mine. He threw water on my motorcycle's one spark plug so I wouldn't be able to leave him, so I would have to stay his buddy and play in the backyard, the only place he was allowed to go. Early before anyone was up, he would fill a tumbler with tap water, then sneak out the front door of his side of the duplex and tiptoe to where the Harley 125 was chained and pour a little puddle around the plug. Later, late and frustrated, drying the plug, grease on my hands, I would yell at him, damn it, Leo, you're making me late. I've got to get to school. And sometimes chase him and pretend I was going to hit him. But he would only repeat what he said every morning of every day of every year we lived in that duplex. You, Leo's buddy, play with Leo. His breathing was noisy and sometimes he drooled and his eyes looked in different directions. Mother would say, I wish they'd keep him off the back porch. And I would say, if he's so dumb, how does he know to ground out my, my spark plug? We knew his age and his mind's age and we knew they didn't match. But we didn't know anything else except he was Italian and his big family kept them there with them in the duplex and they had barbecues in the backyard and drank beer and laughed with one another, and that Leo played on the ground with the other children, like a, like a big pet, I thought. And they all seemed happy enough. I hadn't thought about Leo in years, of course, until just the other day, just after the tests were in, just after the pediatrician in his I am your friend voice said something to us like, well, he'll never go to Harvard Medical School but he'll be very functional and he'll be able to do a lot of things. Later, I wondered if that meant things like ground out a spark plug with a glass of water or play the family pet with the children a third his age. And I thought, sometimes God makes you write things on the blackboard a thousand times. In this poem, the pediatrician was referring to our, to our now 30-year-old son, Ronald, who has autism, and who has benefited in many ways, <coughs> excuse me, in many ways from the ADA. His brother, his older brother Rick, had epilepsy for years, and I was president of the Epilepsy Foundation of America and did my share of lobbying and testifying and been very aware of Tom Harkin for years. Tom was even my congressman when I lived in Van Meter, and he and I were both jet fighter pilots. He in the Navy, of course, me in the Air Force. <laughs> But I am not, in this introduction, going to detail Tom Harkin's many achievements. You know those. I just want to reflect on one subject. There are people in positions of power who have the opportunity to do something for people without power. Too many, too many fail for one reason or another, most of the time, I believe, because to do so requires courage, courage in the knowledge there will be no glory involved, no great press clippings, no big campaign contributions. No, there will only be the eternal gratitude of people you've helped. Because of my involvement with epilepsy, I was president at the, at the White House when the ADA was signed. As you know, Tom had a great deal to do with that. The crowd was made up of many people with many disabilities, and I must tell you, it is more emotion than I can describe. Just think a moment how the subject of my po poem, Leo, would have been changed. How much better life for him and his parents would have been had the ADA been in effect lo those years ago. Here's my point. It's not often in life that we're given the opportunity to do something that benefits not only people living today, but also people who have not even been born yet. Think about that. Think about that. And as you do, be grateful for the man I introduce now, Tom Harkin.
Thank you all very much, and, and Jim, thank you very much for that very kind and generous introduction. Am I coming through in the back? Okay, I, I don't, I'm not getting much of a feedback. First of all, my deepest apologies for being so late. Uh, that's the perils of going through Chicago sometimes. Uh, but I, we finally made it, and I thank you very much for your patience being here. First of all, let me thank Drake University and President Maxwell, who also could not be here uh, for uh, allowing us to have this uh, here. I want to thank the Harkin Institute uh, for Public Policy and Citizen Engagement for sponsoring this, our director, the Honorable Marcia Turnus, the director of the Institute, again, for sponsoring this panel discussion on ADA after 24 years, and thank you for inviting me to moderate it. I appreciate that very much. Thank you all to the audience who are here today. Again, I'm sorry you had to wait an hour that's just what happened, uh, uh, coming out here from Washington sometimes. I want to thank our two deaf interpreters, Susan Hardine and Stephanie Ramey. And I want to thank our distinguished panel, each of whom has been instrumental in advocating for and implementing the four goals of the Americans with Disabilities Act. Equal opportunity, full participation, independent living, and economic self-sufficiency. And I'll just introduce the panel Briefly, then I'll set the stage for hopefully a discussion on these and some other issues, and then hopefully we'll have an audience participation uh, after we get through the first couple of discussions. First, I again, how do I introduce Governor Branstad to anyone here in Iowa or at Drake? Uh, our longest serving governor uh, served from 1983 to 1999, of course, from 2011 to the present, but before that, he served in the Iowa House from 1973 to 79 and as Iowa's Lieutenant Governor from 1979 to 83. Following his first four terms as Governor, uh, Governor Branstad served as President of the Des Moines University from 2003 to 2009 and we did a lot of stuff together. Uh, I, I just want you all to know that under his leadership, the university became the first college in the United States to receive the platinum level of recognition from the Wellness Council of America, Prevention and Wellness. And I appreciate that, Governor, and I appreciate Des Moines University for taking the lead on that. Uh, Governor Branstad has, has uh, spearheaded a lot of things on, uh, on uh, disability policy here in Iowa. I'm going to get to those in just a moment. A graduate of the University of Iowa and, of course, Drake University Law School, so he's back home here this afternoon. Steve Bartlett as a senior advisor with Treliant Risk Advisors in Washington. From 1999 to 2012, he was the CEO of the Financial Services Roundtable, uh, a, an association representing 100 of the largest financial services companies. But he was a member of Congress from 1983 to 1991 when I got to know him. He served on the House Banking Committee and also the House Education and Labor Committee. He was a sponsor or principal co-sponsor of 18 major pieces of legislation, including the Americans with Disabilities Act. And quite frankly, to be honest with you, Steve was our go-to Republican in the House and rounding up votes <laughs> for the Americans with Disabilities <laughs> Act. <laughs> That's right. And then Steve went on to be mayor of Dallas. I visited him couple times when he was mayor of Dallas from 1991 to 1995. I might also say that when he came back to Washington and worked at the Financial Services Roundtable, that's when we had to amend the ADA. I won't go into that, but the Supreme Court had made uh, some decisions in 1999, and we had to have some amendments to straighten the Supreme Court out and tell them what the ADA really meant. It was called the ADA Act Amendments. We got them through, and it was interesting. It was signed into, it was signed into law by George, President George W. Bush, and it was an interesting signing because his father, former President George H. W. Bush, who had signed the Americans with Disabilities Act, was there for that also, and Steve was there. But the reason I'm saying that is Steve, again, helped us round up the votes necessary to get the ADA Act amendments through. He also uh, does a lot of work uh, uh, for Easter Seals and the National YMCA. He served on the President's Commission on Excellence in Special Education. He did not go to Drake, but he went to the University of Texas at Austin. <laughs> 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 now, 
you don't do that around Iowa State, but it's okay here at Drake. It's okay, it's okay at Drake. And <laughs> I lost a bet once on an Iowa State-Texas game, and I had to stand in front of that tower down there, whatever you call it, and hold my fingers up like this. <laughs> anyway, but uh, Steve, thank you very much. And, and I'm also going to talk about how hard he's working to get this, the, the, the Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities passed also. And next to him is Wade Henderson. Uh, Wade is president and CEO of the Leadership Conference on Civil and Human Rights and the Leadership Conference Education Fund. He's had this position since 1996. He's also the Joseph L. Rao Professor of Public Interest Law at the David A. Clark School of Law at the University of the District of Columbia. Uh, Mr. Henderson began his career as a legislative counsel for the American Civil Liberties Union and went on to become the Washington Bureau Director of the NAACP. He earned his undergraduate degree from Howard University and then attended Rutgers University School of Law, a member of the Bar in the District of Columbia and the Supreme Court Bar. And next to him would be Kelly Buckland, Executive Director of the National Council on Independent Living, a position he's held since 2009. He began his career as a social worker in Boise, Idaho, served there for 20 years as executive director. Uh, he's testified many times before different committees of Congress on things like health care and housing, independent living. He's been honored with numerous state and national awards, including the United Vision for Idaho Lifetime Achievement Award, the Hewlett Packard Distinguished Achievement in Human Rights Award, the Drake University Outstanding Alumni Award, and induction into the National hey, Spinal Cord Injury <laughs> Hall of Fame. So as you know, he got his bachelor's degree from Boise State University, but his master's degree here at Drake University. So welcome back home again, Kelly. And Michelle Meters is the current Miss Wheelchair Iowa, crowned on March 15th of this year, two days before the three-year anniversary of the crash that left her with an incomplete C6 spinal cord injury with quadriplegia. After her accident, she worked to regain independent living uh, at a rehabilitation center in Omaha, and she's currently raising funds to represent Iowa at the Miss Wheelchair America event in Long Beach this August. Ms. Meters was appointed by Governor Branstead to serve on the State Independent Living Council and the Iowa Vocational Rehabilitation Council. She also serves on the Iowa Olmstead Consumer Task Force, the Transportation Advisory Group, the Iowa Disability and Agency Aging Advocacy Network, and is a spokesperson for the Iowa Finance Authority. She works as a full-time volunteer advocate, will attend the Nichols annual, annual Conference in Washington next week. Kelly, she's coming in. And she's from Corridon, Iowa, ah, Wayne County, and currently resides in Des Moines. So we have a very distinguished panel. As I said, each in his or her own right have done things to uh, enable uh, the Americans with Disability Act to, to, be a, uh, to be an active, functioning law. You know, I think, I'll just, bef before I go on, I think when most people are asked, what's the Americans with Disabilities Act? They might say something like, oh, yeah, that's curb cuts. Or they might say, oh yeah, that's those parking signs out there that no one ever uses and makes me mad. Or maybe it's lifts in buses, maybe ramps. That's, I think if you ask the average person, they might come up with maybe one of those. But the Americans with Disabilities Act is much more than that. It is a civil rights bill providing opportunity and access for people with disabilities. On July the 2nd of this month, we celebrated the 50th anniversary of the signing of the 1964 Civil Rights Act. That's the act that banned discrimination on race, religion, gender, and ethnicity. 26 years later, on July the 26th of 1990, President George H.W. Bush signed into law the Americans with Disabilities Act, which bans discrimination on the basis of, dis of disability. So from 1964 to 1990, disability advocates around the United States were advocating for them to be incorporated in a broad civil rights bill. As I mentioned earlier, there are four goals enunciated in the Americans with Disabilities Act. Equal opportunity, full participation, full participation in society, independent living, not being put in institutions, and economic self-sufficiency, read that employment. 
So I'd like to start the discussion first along two lines. How does the ADA fit into civil rights? And those four goals, how do they fit into civil rights? And what has been the impact on people with disabilities, their friends, their family? What implementations have been done at the state and local level to, to bring these to life, to get these goals implemented? Uh, last year, I was privileged to attend a summit, an, a, an employment summit at, at DMAC uh, that, that Governor Branstad had sponsored. Uh, and we had a big crowd there, and it was just on the, on the on employment. And I heard there of many of the things that the that the that Governor Branstad's administration has done and is doing uh, to advance these goals of the Americans with Disabilities Act. I might also just thank you, Governor, for appointing a very dynamic head of vocational rehabilitation, David Mitchell, um, who is a well, yeah, you can find is he here? Where is he? Oh, there he is back there. <laughs> a, a very dynamic leader. And so, Governor, and I know you're under some time pressures, and I'm sorry I'm late, but um, tell us about Iowa and the things that, some of the things you talked about last year and what your administration is doing, how, you, how we're going to bring the ADA and, and make it really work in this state. So thank you, Governor. Senator Harkin, thank you. And I know you wanted to get here the worst way, but going by air through Chicago. So, <laughs> but we're glad you made it. And, and thank you very much for inviting me to participate. I want to thank, I want to thank Drake University for hosting this. I want to give some credit to Governor Malloy from Delaware, who put the focus on empowering individuals with disabilities for employment. That's what really gave me the idea to have a summit here in Iowa on that subject. Uh, he made that the focus of the national governors during his year as chair of the national governors. And we are blessed to have a dynamic leader for vocational rehabilitation in Iowa. We also have uh, the Department of Human Rights and the Department of the Blind all work together to try to help people with disabilities to be able to achieve as much as possible. And as we are working to try to bring more business and jobs to Iowa, what we find is we are underutilizing the talents and the abilities of people with disabilities. And actually, we had at that, at that summit that you participated in a number of great examples expressed uh, by individuals with disabilities and businesses on the success they've had. Uh, whether it's uh, large companies, like um, uh, a number of them that we have in the state of Iowa, including uh, uh, companies like uh, um, IV or or the the pharmacy company um, Walgreens, they've been very involved in it. But we even have some individual entrepreneurs. Uh, a young woman that you know from up in Independence has started her own own coffee company, and and so there's just a lot of opportunities. But I think the key is this. We need to recognize people for their abilities, not their disabilities. In some cases, and I learned this at Des Moines University as well, uh, we were able to see people go to medical school and go to other healthcare professions by providing some modest accommodations for them into going through school and then the great contribution that they make to society. And so that is what we really want to do. And I think it fits in so well with our goal to grow the Iowa economy recognizing we have a lot of unemployment and underemployment among people with disabilities. I think somewhat because people just don't recognize that with some modest accommodations, they can do some great things. And, and, and what I found is the people that we have with disabilities that work for the state tend to have better attendance, they're very conscientious, and they make great employees. So they need to be given that chance, and the Americans with Disability Act is really a civil rights act that does say somebody should not be discriminated against because they have a disability. They should be given the opportunity, and we in the state of Iowa want to be a leader in doing that. And we thank you and congratulate you for sponsoring this. Uh, I, I, we're, Mr. Bartlett and I are just remembering, I had the honor of chairing the Commission on 
uh, on on uh, special education, on uh, excellence in special education, and he was a member of that. So uh, and uh, so I had forgotten that we were both on that commission together until uh, you announced the fact that he had served on that commission. So at any rate, congratulations, and uh, we uh, we hope that. Uh, we can build on it. There's still many challenges out there for people with disabilities. We need to keep breaking down the barriers, educating people that uh, you're not doing somebody a favor. You're actually making your business better by choosing people with disabilities to be part of your team. Thank you, Governor. Before I move on, I just add, uh, uh, about a year and a half ago, I was invited to go up to uh, uh, someplace in Connecticut, near Hartford, Connecticut. Uh, Doug Wasson, who is the, the CEO of Walgreens, invited me and a couple, and then he invited a whole bunch of CEOs up there from, oh gosh, FedEx was there, and Procter & Gamble, I mean, heavy hitters. And um, he, he wanted to show us this uh, distribution center they had. So we went up there and had a little breakfast first, and. Um, uh, all these big corporate executives flying in on their private jets. I flew commercial. I won't tell you. Anyway. Um, uh, <laughs> right. <laughs> but I'll never forget Doug saying, I'm going to take you on a tour of our facility. You probably won't notice it, but 50% but of our employees are people with disabilities. 50%. He said, and I'm not doing this out of the goodness of my heart. He said, this is my most productive distribution center in the United States. And it was amazing. Just with small, <laughs> just small, small accommodations, amazing. I could go into that. And by the way, uh, Walgreens is now, uh, Mr. Watson has, uh, put, uh, has set a goal of all of their store employees now, that 10% will be people with disabilities, I think within seven or eight years, something like that. So. That's why what you say is they make the best, sometimes they make the best employees. Uh, let me, um, I was going, I had this listed as Henderson, Bartlett, Meters, and Buckland. So let me go to Wade Henderson next on this. And, and from your standpoint, I mean, you've been involved in civil rights work for all your life and, uh, and disability rights too. Push that lever up. There's a lever there on the side, Wade. Thank you. Can you hear me, guys? All right. Yeah, it is. It's a reasonable accommodation, and I need it. Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. Uh, this is a great audience. Uh, I'm honored to be here. I'm Wade Henderson. I'm president of the Leadership Conference on Civil and Human Rights. Look, the Leadership Conference is the nation's leading civil and human rights coalition. We have over 200 national organizations as we say, working to build an America as good as its ideals. I work in Washington both as a civil rights lawyer and as an advocate for social change. And there are two things that we know. First, if you're not working in coalition, you're not practicing successful politics in the 21st century. No organization has enough strength unto itself to be able to make the kind of change that you want unless you're working in coalition. So I'm especially proud to have the National C Council on Independent Living, Kelly Buckland, as a member of the coalition, they do great work. Secondly, I'm really honored to be on this panel, and I want to thank Senator Harkin for inviting me. It's a special honor, Governor, to be here with you and the great work that you've done, and my friend Steve Bartlett, whom I've worked with for many, many years. What's great about having Steve Bartlett, the Governor, and Tom Harkin here on the panel is that it underscores the argument that civil rights, disability rights, are not partisan issues, they're national issues. And that regardless, <laughs> not partisan, not partisan. A and that you need the work and help of both major parties to make the kind of change that we want in this country. Now, why is this a civil rights issue? Well, Tom Harkin outlined the four goals of what the ADA was intended to do, the first being equal opportunity. And we take the view that every American has an inalienable right to participate in the fullness of our country, in what makes our country unique and great. 
And we take the view, guys, we take the view that regardless of your circumstance, you have the right to the American dream. Everybody has the right to see themselves outside of their own personal experience, accomplishing what you think you are capable of achieving in this country through the dent of your own hard work and with the support of others. But it can't happen unless there is a legal structure in place that recognizes your inherent rights of citizenship to advance your goal. Now, the senator mentioned the 50th anniversary of the Civil Rights Act. I'm honored to be here. A year before that, I was at the March on Washington. I was a 15-year-old kid. I looked at that march as being a life-changing, game-changing experience. Before the march and before the Civil Rights Act, I looked at America in a very different way. My life circumstance, uh, circumstances were circumscribed by the color of my skin. It was the 64 Civil Rights Act that put in place a structure that helped advance goals that I could only dream about but never hope to apply to my own personal circumstances without that law in place. 26 years later, I was honored to be a part of the effort to bring that same benefit of what our country afforded me to persons with disabilities. Because I recognize, just as African Americans, Latinos, women, and others, that without that kind of legal support, they would not be included in the country in the way that they should, and we would not have the richness of the country that we have today without them. So why is it a civil right? It's a civil right because we're all entitled to the benefits of citizenship. It's a civil right because we have to struggle to make that happen for us all, and the movement, the disability rights movement, is responsible for the Americans with Disabilities Act. No one gave that law to persons with disabilities. They earned that law. They earned that law by making their voices heard. <laughs> hey. And making clear that you would not accept second-class citizenship merely because you have a physical or mental disability. And it's that kind of commitment, that kind of, of, of really fight for the rights that you are entitled to have that makes this country unique and great. So we're all part of a tableau. We are part of a tableau that recognizes America as great as it is. And I celebrate the fact that I'm an American citizen. But it's a work in progress, guys. We didn't start out this way. It took a civil war, it took three constitutional amendments, it took 150 years of change and struggle to bring us to where we are today. And if you really want to make the next big leap forward to make sure that the promises of the ADA are not hollow, are not simply symbolic, you're going to have to do the extra additional digging to advance the goals that have not yet been achieved by the law, but that are within our grasp. That's what we're looking for. That's why it's a civil rights issue. That's why I'm honored to be here today. Thanks so much. Thank you, Wade. Before I turn to Michelle, I just you talked about people with disabilities work for this. They work very hard for it for a long period of time. And uh, I can still remember what I thought was the pivotal, pivotal incident <laughs> that galvanized yeah, that's right. America around this. I'd been involved in, in this effort. We were sort of up and down and up and down. We didn't know if we could get it done. Uh, there's an organization called ADAPT. ADAPT. You remember of ADAPT? No? Okay. <laughs> well, the guy that's been running ADAPT for a long time, his name is Bob Kafka. Now Wade was just telling me he just got picketed by ADAPT. Uh, <laughs> I love ADAPT. <laughs> I've been picketed by ADAPT in the past. Uh, but uh, they were the ones always on the front line. I can remember uh, them... Uh, getting all the wheelchairs and they blocked all the traffic on uh, Constitution Avenue at rush hour in Washington. <laughs> Just blocked everything up and they, and they brought, and I went out to watch this. And I was standing along the side there watching them. All the traffic was blocked up in rush hour and they brought the police wagon to take him to arrest him. I think Bob's been arrested 50 times or something like that. Anyway, <laughs> he, 
they, civil disobedience. And so they brought the paddy wagons down to arrest them, but they couldn't even get the wheelchairs in the paddy wagon. <laughs> and all the people in wheelchairs were having a ball with this. See, you, these aren't even accessible. You don't even have, you can't even take us to jail. <laughs> But the thing that, that did this, and Bob Kafka has always been, uh, well, I love him dearly, as you can probably tell, but, but you know, he pushes the envelope. And so one morning, it was uh, in late spring, Bobby Silverstein, who was my staff person, said, uh, I just got a call from Bob Kafka. And he told me to watch the evening news, that they were going to help us get this bill passed. I thought to myself, oh, my God, what's he going to do now? <laughs> I said, Bob, you know what he's going to do? He said, no, he just said, watch the evening news. I was in the Capitol, Governor, later on that day, and, uh, and here's what happened. Bobby comes and gets me. He says, you've got to come outside. You've got to see what's happening. So I went outside, and here's what Kafka did. He's a smart guy, Vietnam veteran, smart guy. What he did is he called all the press, cameras, TV stations. He said, we're going to have a big demonstration at the Capitol, you've never seen anything like it before. And he got them all stoked up. He got about 20 wheelchairs, and they rolled up to the step, Capitol steps. And on the count of three, they all fell out of their wheelchairs and crawled up the Capitol steps. Oh. And police were there, and we're going to arrest them. He said, well, arrest that person that's walking up. This is the only way we got to get up here. Why are you arresting me? That was on the evening news all over America. And from that moment on, we knew we could pass the Americans with Disabilities Act. Yes. <laughs> Jill, I'm going to turn it over to you. Do you. Now, do you have a mic there? I think I'm mic'd up. Thank you. Well, when I got asked to uh, participate on this panel, I could not stop smiling from ear to ear. and couldn't stop crying at the same time. How incredibly blessed am I to be a person with disabilities in the state of Iowa, having two of the most recognized, celebrated people fighting for my rights that I have in Senator Harkin and Governor Branstead. And then, lo and behold, I get to meet these two incredibly cool, well, wonderful guys that are doing it all over the United States. I realized that when I had the accident three years ago that I had a lot of work to do educating people around me. I did not have a color of my skin. I did not have a slant in my eye. All I had was a wheelchair and everybody running to the other side of the sidewalk. I realized that my civil rights movement better start with my mouth. I didn't have legs, didn't really have functioning hands, so I figured if I was going to make the impact, I'd move to Des Moines. Didn't know anybody in Des Moines. Lived close to the Capitol, because I knew I'm going to need that building. <laughs> figured I'd find a place to live. Well, that didn't work out so well. 16 apartments later, I found my 17th apartment. So I figured, well, I better hook up with IFA. Found out that Iowa Financing Authority, they're the people you do that. And then lo and behold, they come up with this cool website for housing to help people with disabilities find housing. Well, that problem solved. Better figure out the other thing. Well, that Olmstead group. I knew about a bill from the Olmstead back in the 1990s, probably, along those lines, and I apologize to my fellow Olmstead members, but I knew that um, the Olmstead Consumer Task Force was the place I was going to need to be, because that way I could make some important uh, movers or shakers and get some things done. So luckily I met Don Francis and, and got appointed to that, and got, uh, I got to learn about um, Governor Branstead's proclamation um, to the Olmstead Consumer Task Force that met individuals with disabilities, had the right to live in that society, in that community, like anybody else, just like my counter or my nice cohort down there said, I 
I get discriminated against and I shouldn't. I'm an American citizen and I live in the great state of Iowa who is changing the way people look with disabilities. So I, I, I decided, you know, this, this Olmstead would work. Then I decided, well, I met Don Francis and Don said, well, now I need you to get on the governor's good side and become, you know, appointed by him to become on the statewide independent living council. You know, then I could open up my mouth even more and <laughs> does some more stuff. And, uh, you know, uh, luckily for me, the governor saw some sort of goodness and, and the rights that I was going to speak about for people with disabilities. So I've been doing that. Transportation became an issue. Well, my golly gee, what do you do? Well, you hook up with the transportation advisory group, you take them on, you're talking about a change that we need for civil rights and change. Transportation's one of them, be a person in a wheelchair and talking about trying to figure out the paddy wagon. You know what, they couldn't, they haven't threatened to arrest me yet and haul me in, but they sure couldn't get me home from the hospital, you know, the other night. I had to do the walk of shame. I did, I looked bad. Didn't, I know, but we're gonna work on that transportation. So there's a lot of things to do, a lot of things to do. So in my case, my fight has really just begun. These guys have paved the most amazing groundwork for somebody like me to be a person with disabilities, to make this nation realize I'm a person just like anybody else. And I have those rights. I should be able to get on a bus and not have any problems, get a job, support myself, feel like I am somebody. And I am. I'm an Iowan, I'm an American citizen, and I am a person with disabilities. With everybody in this room, and with the lovely panelists, our fight's gonna continue. I'm certainly going to see that. Since I've been crowned Miss Wheelchair Iowa, I have a bigger, a bigger stage now. Get to do wonderful things like this. Get to go to the National Center for Independent Living. Get to hang out with Kelly, make sure Iowa's seen there. And then I get to take the great state of Iowa to the National Wheelchair pageant in Long Beach, California, where my platform certainly will be <laughs> exactly the items that we're talking about. And I've got all the assistive technology. This, this wonderful man here has paved the way for me to be able to do things with assistive technology that I never thought possible. But will there's a way, when there's a will, there's a way. And right there, thanks to this lovely man. So I wanted to say to everyone that chose to come out today, you are very blessed to be in the presence of some great people that have paved the way, not only for people with disabilities, for veterans it's gonna become, for the Department of the Aging, but all of you as citizens, because we are all in this big pie together. And it takes a little bit of all of us to make us the great nation that we are. So I say, we're gonna do it all together. And I am very blessed and thank you. Thank you. I'm real proud of you, thank you. Thanks, Governor. Thank you. Bye, Governor, thank you. The governor had to leave. Hello. Yeah, I know the governor had to leave early. You know, I feel sorry for Steve Bartlett. He's next. <laughs> he has to follow that. <laughs> that was wonderful. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you. Uh, you have a great voice, and uh, we need to hear it more. Thank and you. I'll see you next week in Washington. I think so. Steve Bartlett. And, and Michelle, we also really like your tiara. So, so she, in addition to all those other things, she's a princess. As hey, you can see. my buddy down there wants to try it on after. <laughs> there you go. There you go. <laughs> so I did, Governor Branstad actually is, uh, and I know you didn't mean this, but he's leaving on time. 
uh, he is exactly on time. As governor's schedules get to be really tightly scheduled, he's, he's, I think he's going to Grinnell. Grinnell. Is that what he said? Yes. And his, his driver is over here, and he said it's exactly an hour and six minutes away. So uh, uh, he's expected he's expected there. Let me, let me say that when Drake University called, uh, being, being a, a Texan and spend most of my time in Washington, they invited me to come here uh, because, of, because of ADA. I, I, I believe, I fully believe I would have come here anyway. But within Tom Harpin Karkin called and told me I was going to be here anyway, then I decided for certain I would be here. And it's, del it's delightful to be here. And I'm really proud of what Drake is doing with the Harkin Institute. Uh, I've already put the challenge on them of suggesting that maybe Drake could, uh, the Harkin Institute could be the voice and the intellectual framework for independent living and for independence going forward uh, since you've set the, uh, the groundwork for them with, at the Harkin Institute. So that, there's your challenge for the, for the day. Uh, the Senator Harkin has been, you all know this, but in disability circles, he's been our champion. He's been the perseverance. He's been the intellectual strength, the passion, and the energy that uh, in the beginning and continuing on has helped to not only get uh, the concept of independent living and the concept of civil rights and the concept of independence for those with disabilities, but actually a law uh, change with the, with the ADA, and then kept on uh, with additional laws, the amendments, and, and Senator Harkin, I, I, I never told you how I got all the Republicans uh, to agree to those amendments because this was in the mid part of the 2000s, and Republicans, we Republicans, were already showing a little orneriness uh, even, even then. Um, but I just went to him, I said, well, who are you gonna believe? Steve Bartlett or the Supreme Court? Okay, you get to choose. So they, they ah, that was that was nice. the, the, that was the, uh, the the solid the solid argument. But Senator Harkin, you you have shown the the passion to get this done, and our next step will be the uh, the the convention on the rights of disabled persons uh, 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 worldwide. Yeah. yeah. Um, so so indeed the the uh, one other thing about employment. Uh, so I, I listen carefully to the factory, and, that, and I see that around. It's not everywhere, uh, but I do think that America's employers now understand the, uh, the, the abilities of people with disabilities. They understand, and, I, and I'm particularly proud of this, they understand, in my opinion, the concept of reasonable accommodation, where uh, employing someone with a disability doesn't just happen. You have to open your mind and say, okay, what is reasonable and what's an accommodation and what can we do then that this, this will be a great employer, e employee for me. I will tell you that where we started, uh, so, you, so you can remember back that far, in, in the summer of 19, I think it was the summer of 1989, I went through a, a factory, it was a heavy duty factory, made engine blocks in, in Dallas, uh, a rebuilt engine blocks in Dallas, and I met with the management, met with, walked through the, the, the plant, and this is the before story, before the ADA, and then sat down with management, and, um, you know, we talked about all kinds of things, as management likes to do, all kinds of issues that came up. I finally said, well, I have something to ask you. So I asked them what they thought about this concept of a, of a, uh, of a civil rights bill for employment for persons with disabilities. You might imagine that the meeting was in danger of being over right then because they started looking around and saying, oh, my gosh, what's he talking about? So they said, well, you know, that would be nice for everybody else, but we couldn't do that. We're a heavy, heavy machinery factory. I said, well, what about Johnny and your, who runs your shipping department? And the president looked at the general manager, general manager looked at the HR, uh, head of HR, and who looked at the foreman and said, well, what about Johnny? He's actually our best employee, the longest, longest serving employee, and he gets all the awards and everything. I said, well, <laughs> I just met Johnny. Did you know he was deaf? The president looked at the manager, the manager looked at the shoulder. I said, no, I don't know he's deaf. Said, well, yeah, he is, because I just met him and we talked and or we, you know, communicated. I know a little bit of sign and also the, and they said they, they didn't know that. I said, well, do you know what reasonable accommodation you gave Johnny? He said, oh gosh, we probably had to have a video or we had to have all these. I said, no, you actually you took a chain and you chained the ballpoint pen to his desk so that your other employees wouldn't go stealing his pen when they were writing him notes, and that was what he's kept him here as a 20-year employee. Uh, so from that sort of Good moment, but low moment, we've now gone to factories with 50% of their employees with uh, disabilities. Yeah. The ADA is indeed a civil rights bill. Uh, this is our 24th year. Uh, we've come a long ways. We have a long ways to come. But we, we came a long ways because we spent the time with Wade uh, and others, both in Washington and field hearings around the country, to understand what it was going to take. So we decided early on that this was not just gonna be a brochure, it wasn't gonna be a campaign, it wouldn't be a speech, it was gonna be real law. 
Wade and I, when it got over the house, the Senate is a lot easier, I'm sorry, Senator, to say that, but when we got over to the house, we realized that uh, the House has 435 members, and so we decided that we were going to do it in a bipartisan way, as you had in the Senate. We're going to do it right. We're going to get every word. And we spent locked up in a room with you and me and Steny Hoyer and about six others, experts. We spent 100 hours, and we negotiated literally every word on what does this mean and how would it work. And we made a commitment that we're going to get a law that would stand the test of time. It turned out we ran into a little problem with the Supreme Court, but we got that fixed a little bit, uh, uh, a little bit later. And we decided early on, even when, when Senator Harkin introduced it, that this was going to be a law about independence, not about dependence. And I just say those words to show you the contrast. Uh, it actually, most people don't know this, in 1984, President Reagan, who, who, was, who was not in, in, integrally involved with the ADA, but earlier, he appointed a, com a council, a presid another presidential council, that came out with a report that said towards independence that listed dozens of federal laws that were actually barriers. The, the laws were the barriers. And so during the course of the 80s, both the Congress and President Reagan and others knocked down those laws uh, one, at, one at a time, finally leading to the ADA. That, that was Lex Frieden, yes? Uh, leading to the ex uh, now one last, and that is we have a ways to go on employment. Uh, I think the, the acceptance of the law, the architectural standards, the public accommodations, not perfect. Uh, the te assistive technology, not perfect. But I think, you know, we are we're still behind on employment. So we still have to find some ways to break those barriers so that the reasonable accommodations are much more easily identified and accessible going forward. And we probably also have to find some ways sometimes to provide that little bit of support in terms of basically just getting to work uh, and getting ready to go ready to go to work but we're getting there and uh, Senator Harkin it is uh, my honor to to be here with you and to and to pay tribute to you and, and what you have can continue to do thank you here, here. Well, thank you Steve for coming out here you know Steve and I we've known each other now well 26 20 maybe 26 27 years I guess uh, I never heard that story before, but it really rings true to me uh, because uh, many people here know my brother was deaf, my older brother, he's now deceased. Uh, he went to the Iowa School for the Deaf, and they told him at that time, in those days, it was called the Iowa School for the Deaf and Dumb, that's what mm -hmm. they called it. I remember him telling me once, he said, I may be deaf, but I'm not dumb. And so they asked him what he wanted to do, and he, they said he could be a baker, a shoe cobbler, or a printer's assistant. And they asked him which one he wanted to be. He said, I don't want to be any of those. <laughs> and they said, okay, you're going to be a baker. So they taught him to be a baker. Well, he didn't like it, but he became a baker. And he worked in a small bake shop down here in Valley Junction, Palms Bake Shop, Valley Junction. Worked there, he'd go to work at or three in the morning or something like that. He'd been there for several years, and this man kept coming into the bake shop, buy some stuff, and saw Frank and started talking to my brother Frank, and Frank says, I'm deaf, I can't hear. And then, so the guy said, well, what's the sign for something? So, he, so my brother started teaching him some signs. And a kind of a, an interesting friendship for us, and this guy asked him what's, how he liked his job, and Frank said, well, I, he, I didn't like it. Well, what do you want to do? And he said, I want to do something else. He said, I, I'm interested in machinery and equipment stuff. It turned out this man's name was Delavan. <laughs> Mr. Delavan. I can't remember his first name. I always called him Mr. Delavan. Great man. And he owned this manufacturing plant. And they made jet engine parts, uh, jet engine nozzles and nozzles for all kinds of things. And so he asked Frank if he wanted to work for him. And Frank said, well, sure. So he, he did brought Frank down to the Delavan plant in West Des Moines and uh, gave him a job on a, on a piece of equipment that was drilling these little holes in jet engine nozzles and it had to be just exactly right and all that kind of stuff. And it was a noisy place, really noisy. So they trained Frank, trained him how to do this, started working there. Several months go by, his boss, Frank's boss, the foreman comes and says, best worker I got. He never makes a mistake. He's always here on time. Uh, and everything is just perfect. 
gets more parts per hour done than anybody else. He finally figured it out. He didn't hear all the noise and stuff. <laughs> he just kept right on working. He had nothing bothered him. So old man Delavan went out and hired more deaf people. <laughs> that's, a, that's a true story. That, that's a true story. So when you talked about that, it rung, rung true to me. And that's why I say sometimes people with disabilities can actually outperform someone with a disability. When we went to that plant up at Doug Wasson's up, up there at Hartford, uh, there were people with intellectual disabilities that with a modification of a board could fill orders faster and make less mistakes than non-disabled people. Well, I can go into that, but if anyone has a question, I can tell you how they did that. It was fantastic. And in 23 years that my brother worked at Delvin's, he missed three days of work in 23 years because of a blizzard. I lived out at Cummings. So that's why I say people with disabilities sometimes can outperform people without disabilities, and they're loyal, they're hardworking, and they get the job done. So Kelly Buckland, uh, welcome back to your home, <laughs> Drake University, and uh, and tell us about the Civil Rights Act from your con uh, from your con uh, context and what it means in terms of independent living. Uh, it sounds like my wife. My wife. My mic is working. My mouth is equal to my mic. Uh, well, thank you, Senator, and, and to the all the people on the panel. It's a real honor to be here. It's it's great to be back at Drake uh, and be in Iowa. Uh, just a little uh, context for the folks in the audience for uh, where I'm coming from on this. Uh, I broke my neck and got a spinal cord injury on July 26, 1970. If you get the relevance of the date. So July 26, 1990, 20 years later, the ADA is signed into law. Mm -hmm. So the 20th anniversary uh, of me becoming a person with a disability, the most comprehensive civil rights act for people with disabilities is signed into law. Kind of a nice little anniversary gift, I thought. It yes, was nice. <laughs> Very nice. Yep. So the, the globe is a completely different place than it was in uh, July of 1970. <laughs> um, and a lot of that's due to the bill that was signed into law in July of 1990. Um, Nothing looks quite the same, I don't think. When, uh, when I went back to school, uh, my classmates had to drag me up steps to get into school every day, drag me down steps to get out of school. Uh, there was no accessible transportation. I had a car that I was uh, able to drive that my classmates had to put my chair in the trunk and then I'd have my parents would have to get out, get it out when I got back home. All that stuff is completely different now. You, I mean, there's there was no parking spots. There were no wheelchair accessible restrooms. There was, uh, if you were discriminated against, well, I was kicked out of some pretty nice places, actually. Um, <laughs> and you couldn't, you had no recourse. It was like, we don't serve people like you in here. You're in the way. Mm -hmm. You have to leave. You're fire hazard. All those things that were said about people, now if they say that stuff, you actually have some recourse to that. Mm -hmm. It's a it's a different place. You have you, you have rights, and so it's it, it's a different world. Um, I do want to just also talk real real briefly about how I got involved in independent living. I, I became a Center for Independent Living director <laughs> shortly after I graduated from Drake. As a matter of fact, uh, went back to Idaho. Uh, we started up a Center for Independent Living. Went to my first nickel conference, which is. We're going to have one next week mm -hmm. in D.C. Um, and the ADA had not been uh, passed at that point, and George Bush was not a supporter of it. And so at the Nickel Conference, we decided that we would march on the White House. So we did, and Martha Brista was president then. And so uh, we marched on the White House, and we were uh, marching in just pouring rain. It comes down in buckets in D.C. I, being a guy from Idaho, which is a desert, I didn't know it could rain that much, but 
it, we just all got soaked. We were wearing trash bags as uh, rain garments, and uh, and security was different then too, because we marched up to the White House and we were at this guard station, and there's nobody in it, uh, and there's a phone there that you can pick up, and Mar so Marsha goes up and picks up the phone and. Uh, somebody answers and says, I'd like to talk to the president. <laughs> and this is how much stuff has changed, right? <laughs> so, uh, so they say, well, wait just a minute. And she waited for a little while and uh, somebody answered the phone. It was Attorney General Dick Thornburg. And so we got a meeting with the president like a couple of days later during the initial conference. So... Um, and that's when George Bush decided to become mm. a supporter, and Dick Thornburg had a lot to do with that. Yeah. <coughs> so uh, that was my first experience at an initial conference. Mm. And we're going to have something similar this year. But it's not going to be about the Americans with Disabilities Act. It's going to be about the Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities. What we have in this country lots of people around the world don't have. Yeah. And we need to convince the people, there's, and there's only a few of them, that are standing in the road of the United States ratifying the Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities. And we need to convince them that um, it's the right thing to do for America, it's the right thing to do for the rest of the world, and the United States needs to maintain its leadership in the rights of people with disabilities and so we're going to have a little demonstration at this central conference and push the RPD over to Capitol Hill. Nice. Nice. Oh, big. And, and in conclusion, Senator, I just want to thank you for all of your leadership, everything you've done on behalf of people with disabilities. You have, in fact, changed the world. Uh, we still have a little work to do, but we've come a long way. And just last week, uh, well, actually, it was this week. It just seems like last week. Uh, with the signing of the Workforce and uh, Innovation and Opportunities yeah. Act, we created an independent living administration, and you are the man to thank for that. Yeah. I want to really thank you. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, That is a big step. And it was, it was done bipartisan, uh, like we've done every other great thing, and uh, overwhelmingly bipartisan, like the ADA. And had a lot of, it reminded me a lot of the ADA. It was, this country needs to do more of that, and thank you again. That's most excellent. an old uh, story about, you know, if you drive down an Iowa country road, if you're driving down an Iowa country road, I sure assume it's the same in Texas, and if you see a turtle sitting on top of a fence post, you can be sure of one thing, it didn't get there by itself. <laughs> so when people tell me I've done all these great things, stuff, I didn't get there, I didn't do this by myself. <sighs> I had a lot of people working on this, the Bartlett's and Kelly and Wade, my gosh, so many. President George H.W. Bush became one of the best supporters of this. And I can still remember, <laughs> I was, President Bush, for some reason, this is President George H.W. Bush, I was happened to be in Washington on a Friday afternoon, I get a call, my secretary gets a call. The president wants to know if you want to come down to the White House this afternoon for a drink. <laughs> of course, when, where, what time, so. Evidently, Barbara, Mrs. Bush, was out of town. And the <laughs> <laughs> I told that story later. Anyway, uh, so he invited some people down, uh, and he made martinis and went up to the living quarters. He just couldn't have been nicer. And so we were leaving after, you know, it's like an hour and a half or something like that, a little finger food, have a drink, and a bunch of guys around. And so we were leaving, and I went over to that little elevator that goes from the living quarters down. I went over to take the elevator down, 
and Bush was standing there. The president was standing there with another guy, a big, tall guy that I had, never, I had no idea who it was. Big, tall guy. And I saw them standing there, and I said, oh, Mr. President, I'm sorry, I'll walk. I'll go down and take the stairs. He said, no, 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 come on, come on right down with us. So I got in the elevator, the three of us, and it just goes down one floor. And so uh, I, I said, President, thank you for having us over. And uh, the elevator gets down there, and the door opens, and I think to myself, I've got one opportunity. <laughs> I better take advantage of it. I said, Mr. President, I know this is a social event. I don't really want to talk business with you, but do you mind if I bring up something? Oh, sure. You know, he's always so nice. Yeah, sure. What is it? What do you got? I said, well, you know, we're trying to get this disability bill through. Oh, I'm a strong supporter of that. Yes, I'm in back of that. And I said, yes, yes, you are. But we're having some problems with some people. <laughs> I'm not going to mention who. <laughs> he knows that we're having some problems, and, 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 and we, we, we just need your help. He turned to this tall, thin guy standing next to him and said, Boyden, I want that bill done. You take charge. Get that bill. That was Boyden Gray. It was Boyden Gray. He was a chief counsel of the president. And uh, and he got the job done. He he came in and really worked hard on that and helped on the 2008 amendments and still remains a close friend of ours to today. Now, why did I tell that story? <laughs> oh, just about a lot of people. A lot of people worked very hard on worked very hard on this. You know, one thing I just want to mention also. You heard Kelly say it. You heard Michelle say it. And I I, I want to say it also. We talk about people with disabilities. I implore you, don't ever say a disabled person. A disabled person, you're modifying the person with a disability. You're defining that person as being disabled. As you'll notice, people with disabilities, that's what they say. I'm a person first, and I have a disability. I am not a disabled person because I'm a person. I may have a lot of other abilities. I may have one disability. I can't walk or something like that, but I got a lot of other abilities. So it's an interesting concept, and I, I just ask you to be sensitive about it uh, as you talk about it with people uh, and get your person to think that way. Kelly talked about stairs in school. So I told you about my brother Frank, but early, sometime after that, my nephew Kelly, my sister's boy, was in the Navy. He was on an aircraft carrier like I'd been on, and he was a deckhand, and he got sucked down a jet engine. Oh. Pilot had inadvertently ran up his power. He crawled under, got sucked down the intake, broke his neck, about the s about, about where you are. <laughs> and uh, it was just, I remember my sister calling me, and it was just, it was just tragic. He lives. He's alive today. He's 50 some years old now. But Kelly, so he went through a lot of rehab uh, at the hospital out in California. But then he wanted to go to school. He'd never, he hadn't gone to college. So I remember him calling me up one day. He went to Colorado State University, and they lived in Colorado at Fort Collins. And he called me up and said, Uncle Tom, he said, this is terrible. I want to go to this class, and it's on the second floor, and there's no elevator. I can't get my wheelchair into the, this place or that place. I can't even go to school because it's not accessible. And I, I, I'll tell you all, that got my mind thinking. This, was, this would have been 1980, uh, around 1980, 81. Mostly I had been thinking only about deafness because of my brother. Now I started thinking about a different concept also about disability. And I realized that disability was a lot more than just deafness. And the later I met Danny Piper, a kid with an intellectual disability, uh, who became the, I, was, I can say, I, beca I, I had him testify before a Senate committee. First time ever a person with Down syndrome had ever testified mm -hmm. before a Senate committee. Mm -hmm. and, and that opened my eyes to the fact that it's not just physical disabilities, it's intellectual disabilities too. It's autism. It's Down syndrome. It's, uh, but, they, but people with the proper training and, and the proper support can be full citizens, as you said, full citizens of our society. So I get, the other thing I just, I, I wanted to go, I know Kelly has to leave very soon. I, 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 I mean, really soon. Yeah, like, like right now? Like a couple of minutes ago. <laughs> can, I, can I ask you just to address one thing? Just employment. Just tell us about 
the problems that, it, that are inherent with employment, transportation being one of those maybe? Yeah, as a matter of fact, uh, I was uh, kind of sent here on a mission <laughs> by my wife. Uh, you, you're talking about different kinds of disabilities that are covered. Uh, my, my wife has epilepsy and uh, transportation and people with epilepsy, it, it's a big disconnect okay. there and it's a big barrier to people getting to uh, work. Uh, I think there uh, are a lot of things that are uh, contributing to the low unemployment rate amongst people with disabilities. Uh, transportation is absolutely one of them. Mm -hmm. I still think discrimination is uh, playing an incredibly big role. Uh, and I think that the economy has, uh, the downturn in the economy has played uh, a bigger role in people with disabilities than those without. Uh, we still have a, a completely outdated benefit systems where we pay people to not work and we penalize them if they do go to work. Uh, we, we need to fix it. I mean, the social security system hasn't really changed in 40 years and it needs it needs to have changed 20 years ago. Uh, th there's a big problem there and it's really preventing a lot of people from going to work. Uh, so I think there's a, a whole bunch of factors playing but I, I have to tell you, Senator, I'm very encouraged uh, because there's a, there's a lot of people and a lot of organizations, a lot of the ones that are members of uh, WAVE's organization and the, and the WAVE's organization in and of itself that are really making employment of people with disabilities a priority. And we're, we're gonna, and Governor Markell, who uh, was mentioned earlier, uh, there's this real energy, I think, around getting people to work. And so I'm very encouraged by that. Mm -hmm. And I think the passage of WIOA, or the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act, was, was one of those uh, demonstrations of where this country is and, and where it wants to be in terms of employment. Uh, that sort of bipartisan, overwhelming bipartisan support around that bill really, I think, uh, is a real demonstration of where the country wants to move to. We're, we're tired of living in poverty, we're tired of being unemployed, and we really need to move. Uh, yeah, live on. Going back to the, you know, I, I'm sorry. The other person without a disability that was laid off, three people with disabilities were laid off, three to one. Yep. And so when people say, well, when, we, when the economy comes back, we need equal, no, we need a little unequal, we need three for one hiring back too. I think, it, uh, you correct me if I'm wrong, about two out of every three persons, adults with disabilities, who want to work, who can work, are unemployed. Uh, uh, two thirds, that's 60 some percent, folks. That's not 6%. That's not 6%. Yeah, a lot of them have just uh, stopped even participating in the workforce. They, they're not even looking anymore because they've become so discouraged. So we really have to change. Uh, and then I, I do have to really go, but Senator, if I could, uh, just as a parting, uh, again, I really want to thank you for uh, having me here, and uh, and it was a real honor to be with all my friends, including Wade and uh, Michelle and Don. I'll see you guys in D.C. in a few days. And the rest of you, will you please get on the phone uh, and call Senator Grassley and tell him to vote for CRPD. We need the CRPD. Go CRPD. Safe travels. Thank you. See you next week. Okay. Now, uh, CRPD has been mentioned a couple of times. Are you all familiar what that means? I mean, I, a lot of people don't know. It's the Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities. Thank you, Kelly. Thanks. See you, Kelly. Here's how it came about. In the late 90s, a, a, a UN committee decided they wanted to promulgate a, a treaty on the rights of people with disabilities. They had just done one on the rights on, on, on child labor. And they wanted to, so they sent people down to Washington, met with my staff, uh, didn't meet with me, they knew I didn't understand it all anyway, so they met with my staff to get all of the details. And they spent several years developing it. I think they promulgated it around 2007 or so, somewhere in there. and. Uh, 
And uh, it's based, it literally, and I had people who were in charge of that at the UN tell me that your Americans with Disabilities Act informed us as what we had to do. And so it really does track a lot of the Americans with Disabilities Act. Now they promulgated, 148 countries have signed on to it, uh, but we haven't yet. And what happened was two years ago it came up uh, in December of 2012, it failed by s actually five votes, five votes, it failed by. And um, uh, a lot of people said we shouldn't be voting on a treaty in a lame duck session. So then that Congress died and then it had to be resubmitted again by the president, had to go through hearings again and all that kind of stuff. And uh, uh, Senator Menendez now is the chair of that committee, it was Kerry who went on to be Secretary of State. And that bill was just reported out of the committee this last week. Under the rules of the committee, it has to sit for th three days. It will be put on the Senate floor on Monday. And then it has to lay over 24 hours before it's put on the executive calendar because it's a treaty. So Tuesday, from Tuesday on, is when we could actually take action on it. So that's what it is, the Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities. I said 148 countries have signed on to it. And many of them, I was just recently in China uh, meeting with uh, a lot of disability groups in China. Uh, one government, most of them non-governmental organizations springing up in China. So China signed the CRPD. And the people who headed a lot of these disability groups were wondering why we hadn't signed it. And they, they said, we need you. We need you to be involved in this. You're the leaders. You're the best country in the world with disability laws. We need you as part of this to help us so when we go up against our government and we want our government to start changing things, we need you as part of the group, not just as the United States. And this was very interesting because some people say, well, we could do it one-on-one. -on -one. And I mentioned that. And this woman said to me, well, that's, that, look, if you come here to try to instruct us on what to do in terms of disability and you're using the Americans with Disabilities Act, you're talking one language and we're talking another language. Mm -hmm. But if you come here as part of the Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities, mm -hmm. we're talking the same language. Mm -hmm. I'd never thought about that before. So there are a lot of countries that are really looking to us to be a part of this, to provide that kind of leadership, not just one-on-one -on -one, but as as a community of nations, um, and it is, it's, it's, it really does look a lot like the Americans with Disabilities Act. And, that, and look, I'm not, I'm not here to tell you that once it's, if we join it, it's gonna change the world overnight, it won't. But it will start us on the path. It'll start changing things. Senator, let me, let me just interject one thing, because you've left out in this great story about the disability treaty an event that happened last week, guys. Uh, I'm sorry, last week, it happened two days ago. What am I talking about? And, and it, it left such an incredible impression on me, but also uh, I think a larger world. And that is, that was a press conference the day after the treaty came out of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. The press conference was organized by Senator Harkin and John McCain and Senator Kelly Ayotte from New Hampshire, an incredible Republican voice in support of the treaty. Mark Kirk, Republican senator from Illinois. Mm -hmm. And it was joined by, by Senator Bob Dole, who had just celebrated his 91st birthday the day before. Bob Dole came to the Senate, obviously a place of many of his greatest accomplishments. And as you know, he was one of the great champions of the Disability Act. Yeah. So Dole comes in, and he's talking about the importance of this treaty. But he is joined at the podium by every major leader of a veterans organization in the country. So the American Legion was there. Paralyzed veterans were there. Boat vets were there. The Iraq-Afghanistan vets, the Vietnam veterans were there. They were all there, guys, and they were talking about what this treaty means to veterans who gave everything for the country. 
but now can't get the support they need to be able to travel around the world, to be able to work overseas, to bring their families, their children, because the countries in which they'd like to work often don't have the accommodations that would be necessary to allow them to do what they can do. Now, to have veterans standing up in unison saying that they need this treaty to fulfill the American dream that they have, it does seem to me that's a small price to pay mm -hmm. to help make the global standard mm -hmm. what the ADA represents. And so we're not just talking about a treaty that has no meaning. This is a treaty that in time will shape the expectations that we all have about what countries owe their citizens when their citizens have disabilities. And, and you know, we talked about the import of the Americans with Disabilities Act. As far as I'm concerned, one of the biggest things the ADA did was to change public expectations about what it meant to be a person with disabilities. I mean, I know that before the Civil Rights Act of 1964 was passed, the world looked at African Americans, and I'm talking about US leaders, looked at African Americans differently, looked at us differently. We were and are entitled to everything that every American enjoys, but we have to change public attitudes to make that happen. You know, we talk about transportation and what it means to people with disabilities. Guys, I remind you that it was the struggle over transportation that lit the spark uh. on the modern civil rights movement. Mm -hmm. It was Rosa Parks sure who was. said, I'll be damned, I'm not standing mm -hmm. on this bus. I paid the same fare that you paid. Um. And I expect to sit down just like you, okay? And it was because of her insistence Backed up by, I, I might say, it wasn't just a woman who was tired. That was an organized effort. The NAACP had organized that effort and was prepared to back it up day in and day out. And that's what brought about the change. It wasn't just a tired woman who said, I'm not going to, you know, no. It was somebody who was organized. She was the tip of the spear. And that's what the disability community has to be in defense of its own rights. So, you know, I'm not telling you what to do. This really is a nonpartisan issue. But to have Drake University, as you do, serve as a beacon and an inspiration, not just here in Iowa, but around the country for the kind of work that we're doing here in advancing the integration of persons with disabilities into the larger society. You know, to have a, a member, regardless of what party affiliation, she may be, to take the position that they can't support a treaty which means so much to the citizens of your state is not something that you can accept just by virtue of the answer that person gives. You have to go back and say, look, let me give you the evidence of why you should be on here. And let me tell you what it means to us, those of the voters who live in your state, who want to tell you about that. So we need your help, guys. We need you to raise your voices. We need you to make your presence <laughs> felt. Good. That's what's needed. Some time and you can help us do it, okay? All right. Well, thank you very much. Uh, Senator Harkin. I, 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 uh, Marcia. <laughs> I think we've gone for about 75 minutes. So if you'd like to give some closing remarks or we could take a couple of questions from the audience. Could we do some from the audience? I'm sure. I, I know there are people here who. We, 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 have, we have microphones. And if someone's I could. Gonna get, someone's going to get you a microphone here very well, shortly. Hold on a second. If I could just say since we oh, have gone on I'm so sorry. long. Oh, they're out here. They're out here in the. Or we can. Okay. If I can just say, please let's keep the questions brief since we don't have very much time. Thanks. Uh, I am a blind person. Uh, my, my husband is, is blind also. And I just wanted to talk a little bit about other kinds of barriers that we face as blind persons because no one has spoke at all about blind persons and what kind of barriers they face every day. In transportation, 
in having the newspaper read to you or your, the printed material, w at one time we couldn't even go to the voting mm -hmm. machine. We couldn't even go without taking somebody or having a Republican and a Democrat go with us <laughs> to mark our ballots. All of these issues mm -hmm. that we have now mm -hmm. because of Senator Harkin's work and the panel's work towards making disability rights, not just making accessible physical barriers, but making accessible uh, the printed material. And having that, now we're talking about the money. We're going to have our bills identified. We are going to be able to do our own money because of the Disability Act and, and so on. And I just wanted to say thank you very, very much. One thing, one, one other comment that I'd like to make, because recently Senator Harkin was on a plane and his brother had problems reading. He couldn't, he couldn't, um, he could not watch the movie. I went <laughs> to a movie um, and I had to have something read to me. We need more verbal access. And uh, Mary Margaret here has been um, very much in our community trying to make accessible in drama, newspaper, and other things. And I just wanted to thank her for getting me to the microphone and listen, listen to thank her. You. There's physical barriers and there's other kinds of barriers yeah. and accessibility is not just going up a wheelchair ramp. Absolutely. Thank you. Absolutely. Well, thank you. I, I just want to say. Well said. I just want to say we had s some good news today. The Department of Justice issued today a notice of proposed rulemaking to make all movies and movie theaters have both uh, accessibility to closed captions for the deaf and voice uh, description for oh, people who are blind. Yay! Came out today. Oh, what a good word. Yes. Oh, that's beautiful. Uh, let's take it just a couple more. Hi, my name is Kevin Dalen, and I stand. Let me try this a little closer. Is that better? Yes. My name is Kevin Dalen, and I come before you as a small business owner, as well as a re rehabilitation counseling student, as well as an individual with a mental health disability. And one of the things that I see coming up in my very near future is the financial cliff of transitioning from Social Security to full support of myself. Mm -hmm. And that was brought up briefly. And one of the things that I really would like to be involved in as I move forward is on a national level trying to make those changes and want to know who best to work with in order to incorporate that. That's kind of where we started back in 19, 1980 with Section 1619. Uh, uh, it, is, it, is, it is a continued problem. So if you'll give me your email address afterwards, let me, let me give some thought to that as to who to, who to work with. Uh, I, would, I would say Senator Harkin, but we're going to have to get him on the ballot and do a write-in. <laughs> oh, <all> God. <laughs> so, so absent that, uh, let me come up with a name for you. Uh, prob probably Steny Hoyer in the House, I would think, but uh, we'll see. Or uh, why don't we give, uh, since it's in Social Security, which is the Senate Finance Committee, why don't we give Charles Grassley something, uh, so, uh, something to chew on for that? That's right. Senator Grassley's on the Finance Committee. No, it, it, yeah, that would be. Good. It, these are great suggestions, guys. I, I would just say, look, a lot of change Thank occurs you. because non-governmental organizations push to make it happen, and government Thank responds. You. So organizations like Kelly's organization, you know, Nickel. Organizations like the American Association of People with Disabilities, AAPD, National Organization on Disabilities, these are all organizations that lift their voices and amplify 
the voices of people like yourself who are working to make change. So I would also look at some of the non-governmental organizations where your talents and, and your enthusiasm for bringing about change make a difference. Uh, I would only want to add one other response to the young woman who just spoke, and uh, uh, Senator Harkin talked about today's change with the Department of Justice. One of the big problems that we're concentrating on, guys, is making sure that people can cast a ballot when they vote with privacy and independence and to the extent possible, based on your own judgment, you shouldn't be required to take someone in with you if you are able to conduct your affairs with some minor accommodations. Obviously, there's some people who need that assistance and would welcome it, but there are many others who feel that that's an indignity because they are capable of casting their own vote. The Department of Justice has to issue guidance to make sure that existing laws like the Help America Vote Act like the requirements of the ADA and the requirements of the Voting Rights Act are enforced vigorously. And when we do that, we can make change. So the issue that you've talked about, sir, which is really the, the, the cutting edge issue of today for people with disabilities, how do we allow, how do we earn the kind of income that our work can generate with some modest accommodations and changes with existing laws and regulations. And the government should not, through its benevolence, actually adopt provisions that work to the detriment of people with disabilities. So when Kelly talked about needed reforms in our financial services area, that is, of course, the next new frontier. And I think with your help, we are going to be able to make change. That's what we need, your persistence and your commitment. So thanks very much. I, I, I'm going to suggest that anybody else who has some questions can talk with the panelists at the conclusion of the program because we've kept the audience here for an hour longer than originally. So keep your question and you can ask. But um, would you like to make some closing comments or should I wrap it up? The only closing comment I have is just thank you all very much for being here, uh, for being uh, interested in, in this issue. Uh, there, there's so many facets to it. And, and, there, and we still have a long ways to go in so many areas. And so I hope that, I hope <laughs> that the Harkin Institute, under the able guidance of Marcia Turnus, will uh, take this up and, and this will be a part of what the Institute uh, looks at in terms of, of uh, a, a broad aspect of disability law and, uh, and become a center of excellence perhaps for uh, disability studies uh, and be also a place where we can work with other countries uh, in exchange programs on, um, on disability issues. So I, I think I want to thank Marcia Turnus for a great organization that she's running and Drake University and I see so many board members here. Thank you very much Thanks. for serving on the board of the Harkin Institute. Well, I will add one thing that has been alluded to but hasn't been said explicitly, so I'm going to say it explicitly. Uh, and that is that what is needed here and what we're a little short of right now in the disability community is more grassroots political involvement. Uh, we need political involvement. We need people to go to the town hall meetings, to meet with the senators, meet with the congressmen, and essentially say that independence for persons with disabilities is a good thing. And frankly, senator or congressman, we're going to hold you accountable for how you vote and what you do yes. and whether, as the Iraqi war veteran said this last week, said, you're either with us or you're against us. Yep. Yep. And so we need some help. Uh, and, I, and I do have to say, and with all respect, I think that we in the disability community in the last, after the ADA, we kind of a little bit went to sleep in terms of political action. So let's get some political action yes, back sir. to the, yeah. to the let's table. Let's do it. We got it. Let me thank Senator Harkin and our panelists. It's been a wonderful discussion. I've learned a lot. I hope it's been inspiring to everyone here. A huge thank you to the best audience in the world, the most patient and engaged audience I've had the pleasure to uh, be present for. Uh, have a safe journey home, and please attend future Harkin events. We have your emails now. <laughs> Good evening. Yay.